Okay, time now for Top Picks with Andrew Pyle. Adobe is number one. Andrew, ticker symbol ADBE. Why so? Uh, so for us, this is a, yet another play into the AI space, Paul. And it's interesting and somewhat ironic that we've seen weakness in the stock price over the last little while on concerns that you know competition is starting to heat up in the AI space or generative AI space, especially with respect to videos. Uh, and we've seen downside pressure on the stock. Companies just coming out of its summit conference, and I think the analyst takeaways from that conference were largely positive in that across its entire suite uh, of products, it is now looking at uh, AI being included in all of them. So whether we're talking about documents, whether we're talking about Firefly, which is one of its new uh, generative AI uh, platforms. So we think the, the company is well positioned to integrate AI into its products, the products that are already popular, and acknowledging that there is some competition. But again, we're talking about a company that has a fantastic footprint uh, in the market. Stock has been bouncing around $500 the last little while it seems to be finding support in that area. So we think uh, this is a good opportunity to start piecing into the stock. We actually own the stock on the CDR exchange, Paul, uh, where we're buying it in a Canadian dollar hedge fashion as opposed to buying it in New York. Uh, explain to us what the CDR market again is. Those are just depository receipts trading in Canada that reflect individual U.S. stocks, correct? Exactly. So some like an ADR, Paul, in the, in the States, if we're buying European companies in New York using the ADRs, here we're using CDRs or Canadian depository receipts to buy large cap U.S. stocks uh, in Canadian dollars with that Canadian dollar hedge in place. Uh, you're still owning Adobe. You're going to have a stock that's going to trade uh, alongside it. Why are we doing it that way as opposed to just simply buying it on the New York Stock Exchange? Uh, currency risk, Paul. Um, you know, buying a stock like Adobe in New York and getting a good gain on it. Let's say we get a 10% lift. Canadian dollar goes up 10% and Canadian dollars I'm now net zero. So this is just a way to you know neutralize that currency fluctuation. But the stock itself, we think the fundamentals are absolutely sound. We like the company uh, and we like the products. And again, the fact that they've really shown um, a strength in you know integrating AI into all these different platforms that they have. Okay, number two on this day, Brookfield Infrastructure Partners, ticker symbol BIP.U. Andrew? Yeah, this is a you know a play on a couple of things. One is, you know, where do we think interest rates are going uh, into 2025? Obviously, we think interest rates are going down. You know, even modestly, we're going to get good global economic growth pickup from that. Uh, infrastructure spending demand is just going to get stronger and stronger and stronger, uh, whether we're looking at bridges, whether we're looking at ports, again, timely in light of what we have just been through. Uh, and when you're buying Brookfield infrastructure, you're, you're almost kind of like buying an ETF in our opinion in terms of the businesses that this company uh, has under its umbrella. Uh, we like the dividend yield on that. We think we're going to see continued dividend uh, growth, um, but we like the economic fundamentals in a recovery phase on lower interest rates. We think that'll be supportive for the company's stock. Okay, Brookfield Infrastructure's number two. Number three, the final top pick on this day, the Vanguard FTSE Emerging Markets All Cap Index, ticker symbol VEE. -E. This is, a, of course, an emerging markets investment. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, Paul, we've been out of emerging markets for a little while, um, mainly because of China. And, you know, last year, this time last year, we were talking about, you know, this amazing rebound in the Chinese economy that we were going to get with the lockdowns being removed. And clearly that did not pan out. So we've been very, very uh, reluctant to get our feet in the waters until we're certain that, you know, China is going to be on an improving path, which we believe they are. This particular ETF gives us a slightly larger weighting towards China than some of the other uh, passive ETFs in the emerging market space. Uh, it's relatively low cost, but really this is a play on China at a point where we think uh, we can start to see some sustainable improvement uh, in the economy, in the market, uh, and ultimately this is a good vehicle to give us that exposure. What, what, what would you say to, uh, to investors, Andrew, about risk in emerging markets and I guess therefore the proportion of a portfolio that, uh, that should or can be devoted to emerging markets exposure? Yeah, emerging markets is going to be one of the higher risk components of your portfolio, Paul. It's not going to be like having positions in the Canadian blue chip equity space. So you have to treat it as such. Uh, and for a lot of portfolios, you know, that risk tolerance for higher risk may be, you know, zero to 20 percent. Um, this particular position, we're basically five percent weighted uh, in our models. Uh, so very conservative weighting. It's there for growth. Um, but with growth comes higher risk. 
uh, and you have to be mindful of this. This is not something where you place a large bet, uh, for example, on China and move a ton of exposure into a vehicle like this. But I think it does offer some opportunities to provide growth within the portfolio around some of your core holdings. Does your pick of this one include any type of call on the U.S. dollar, which is so crucial to emerging markets because many emerging market economies uh, have debt that is priced in U.S. dollars? Yeah, that's a great point, Paul. And yeah, clearly, if we think we're going to get rate cuts over the next 12 to 24 months, um, my opinion on that is that that will probably uh, turn into a weakening trend for the U.S. dollar. Uh, and if we get that weakening trend, that is usually supportive for a lot of things, whether it's commodities or, in this case, emerging markets. So that is part of the thesis, Paul, behind this. Uh, but it's also the fact that we think we're going to get stronger growth out of China and even India, for that matter. India is on very solid footings right now in terms of its economy. It has a high weighting in this particular ETF. Uh, so three factors there that uh, support the thesis going forward. Time now for top picks from Eric Nuttall. Number one on this day is Crescent Point Energy, CPG on the TSX. Crescent Point remains a very misunderstood stock. I don't think people appreciate the rate of change in this name. People still think of us, this as you know, a, a former management in southeast Saskatchewan drilling Hunter Barrel Pretty Wells. They've spent uh, two years repositioning into the Duvernay and the Montney, both of which have well over a decade. The Montney, they think two decades at least worth of stay flat, high quality inventory. They're drilling some of the best wells ever drilled in that area of the play. And yet the stock on our math at $80 oil and $4 gas next year trades at 3.4 times cash flow and an 18% free cash flow yield. They've committed to return 60% of that free cash flow back to us. They're active on buybacks. Uh, we see 60% increasing potentially uh, later next year as they pay down some of the debt that they took on to acquire uh, some of these assets. We think a 10% free cash flow yield is a reasonable uh, goal for valuation. That would be a five times cash flow multiple, and that would be about a $19.28 stock price. So in, in a market that where energy stocks have done well, you've got, a little, you've got to get a bit more creative. You've got to do a little bit more uh, work to find those opportunities. We still see this stock offering potential like material upside. Okay. Crescent points number one. Number two today, Baytex Energy, BTE. This is very much a contrarian, out of favor uh, story for a couple of reasons. One is kind of similar to, to Tamarack, but not quite as much. They did do an acquisition last year um, and they bought acreage in the Eagleford to be, have an operated position that did create an overhang. The, the uh, private equity sponsor has sold a one third of their position. They continue to own about 12% of the name. At some point, you would think that they would be uh, sellers of that stock. I do think that stock could be placed very easily, in my opinion, and the stock could uh, run after that. Secondly, they did take a, a modest reserve write down on some of their, their tier two, tier three uh, plays like non op in the Eagleford. Um, uh, some of their Viking stuff, etc. The reason why we continue to like this story, they're drilling top uh, quartile wells on that acreage that they bought from Ranger. They have a technical team that saw something that other people did not. Two, they continue to make uh, discoveries in conventional heavy oil, which we're very bullish on in Canada. We're bullish oil, we're bullish on the WCS differential, given the TMX is online, should be in the next month, which is massive for that differential. Thirdly, we're bullish on a change in federal government, alleviating the discount that we have on these names. And so there's a very strong value proposition. We've got the name trading at 2.8 times forward cash flow and a 22% free cash flow yield next year. That's at $80 oil. So very, very inexpensive. It's been a frustrating name. What I like to see you asked earlier in the show, the CEO continues to buy stock. He's bought $5 million worth of stock. He's a new CEO. He's been there for roughly a year. He bought $100,000 last week at $4.87 a Canadian. And so I, I like to see that. So this continues to be a, a very, very significant position for us. And again, in a world where a lot of names have moved, you've got to find those value stocks versus value traps. We think there's enough catalyst embedded in this name to get a, a strong rally of, at some point this year. The startup of the TMX expansion is imminent. Do you think the, uh, the na narrowing of the differential between Western Canadian Select and WTI is, 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 has more to go? No. Uh, we, th we use 1250. Right. So it, at times when there's seasonal strength for, for heavy oil or bitumen, you could get down to 10. Winter time when you're not you know, asphalt and such, 15, give or take. So we're using $12.50. This was a massive, massive theme for us. It's the reason why we, we did so well in Meg, Athabasca, Baytex One Day, Synovus, et cetera. We, we had 70% of our fund 
revolved around this theme. And so you just have to, you know, you, you invest based upon a thesis, you have a catalyst, the catalyst occurs or is occurring. People may not be aware of that, but it's occurring. They're literally filling up the pipeline as we speak. Right. And you have to be disciplined to say, okay, risk versus reward today versus six months ago. So we just, you know, maybe you go from a 10% to a 5% weight in some of these names. There's still value, but just not as much as six months ago. Okay, the final uh, top pick on today's edition of Market Call with Eric Nuttall, Precision Drilling, PD. Pre yeah, th this is just a, a ridiculously inexpensive name, and people don't appreciate how much they've paid down debt. That was my hang up. Uh, we bought 9.9% of the company over the past four or five months at 82 ish. We still see very significant upside. We have the name of very, being very reasonable in terms of drilling activity. It's weak because of natural gas, especially in the United States. Day rates, we're, we're being, like, we think, conservative. We have them trading at a 26% free cash flow yield this year. This is on equipment the last 20 years. 26% free cash flow yield this year, 30% next. They've committed to return 30 to 40% of that free cash flow to investors this year. We think that is too low. I'm actually presenting to their board in a few hours' time. We think it should be 50%. They trade at a meaningful discount to their U.S. peers because they're uncompetitive on that return of capital. Uh, we see material upside. We, we think this stock could potentially, if they got remotely close to their U.S. peers, has over 100% upside. Time now for Top Picks with uh, David Burroughs. As promised, JP Morgan is uh, our first Top Pick of the day today. Yeah, so at Barometer, you know, the number one thing is we need to own the leader in a, in a, in a sector. And as I mentioned, JP Morgan made its first new all-time high after the financial crisis in 2013, the XLF, not until 2021. So, you know, they were way ahead of the group. They've got by far the best balance sheet. They've spent the most on technology. They've got the best leadership. Uh, and, you know, we've come from a world that was flooded with free capital, so hard to get pricing, to a world where capital's become a little bit more dear. Uh, and not just for consumers or businesses, but for regional banks. And, you know, funny how uh, failing regional banks fall into the hands of JP Morgan very, very profitably. Um, they've raised their dividend twice this year, so their dividend growth for this year is 15%. That should continue. Uh, and as pricing power improves, we think that this will be an, out, a, a, an outperformer and again, a centerpiece really for any portfolio. Okay, uh, here we go to the gold sector now. Alamos Gold has recently made an acquisition, AGI on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Yeah, so, so look, we just talked about the fact that the, the gold producers have been horrible underperformers for a long, long time. One of the big problems has been the inflation and their costs. Uh, as price goes up. Um, so, <clears throat> but there is a time and a place. Uh, and what I know is when, when uh, groups start to perform after a long, long period of underperformance, there will be some winners. So we want to own something that has uh, uh, safety from a jurisdictional perspective. So Alamos is in Canada and Mexico. Uh, you want to be diversified across some different assets. It's a multi-asset company, in other words, multiple mines. Uh, and you want to have some, some product, pr production upside. Um, so without getting too complex, I think that this is one of the companies that technically looks the best in a sector that looks like it's just starting to lift. And there will be pullbacks and shakeouts and so on. Uh, we also own Agnico Eagle and we own some Kinross and I am not a gold bug. But again, there's a time and a place. I, I mentioned to you off camera that uh, some longtime watchers of this sector believes that takeovers uh, do not have a, a track record of building a value for shareholders. That w one case where that may be different, and it's rare, is when the two mines are right beside each other. And that's the case in the Alamos uh, very recent acquisition of Argonaut Gold. The two properties are within 300 meters of one another, that's I believe, and they'll be able to use now a common mill for milling the gold. Well, well, you know, the same thing happened with Gold Corp years ago in Red Lake, right. and, and same thing. There was a pillar between the two companies that they could then mine and get value out of. So I think this is interesting. You know, we don't have a huge gold weight, but I think that it's timely, and if we talk 12 months from now, it's probably going to look pretty good. Okay, and we will go uh, now to Imperial Oil, one of the uh, big players, of course, in the Canadian oil space. It's an integrated player. It uh, produces uh, oil. It uh, refines oil as well. What are your thoughts on IMO? Yeah, very simple. It's a, it's a company that could be in the place of a CNQ, 
Um, they're returning capital to their shareholders. Their debt levels are down to about 19%, so they're where they want them. We're going to get dividend growth north of 20%. They've grown their dividend 23% a year over the last five years. Uh, and uh, again, energy is one of the most under-owned sectors in the world. Canadians like it a little bit better, mm -hmm. but it's an under-owned sector. And Canadian oil companies trade at a discount to the global players. So, again, I think that there's good value and good total return going to come from the appreciation and the dividend growth. Do, do these stocks need ever higher oil prices for the stocks to do well? Look, certainly higher oil prices are better. But what's important is that this new Trans Mountain pipe is going to take a bunch more oil from Alberta. The differential on the oil in Canada to the price in the U.S. is going to continue to squeeze in. And in the most recent couple of months, there were, I think, 2 million barrels got sent from B.C. down to L.A. for the first time in a while. Um, so there's a pickup in volumes there that I think is really going to help. These and do you companies. think these stocks are going to become more attractive to the general investor, the large, the large institutional investor who maybe has stayed away from them? You know, look, pension funds and foundations and so on don't own these things uh, and haven't for many years. I think they're going to have to. All right, it's time for Top Picks on Market Call with Shane Obata. And we're going to start with a well-known company, Alphabet. This is the parent of Google. And what is it about? I mean, I don't think we have to explain the business to too many people, but what makes it a top pick today for you? Yeah, I think I've, I've, people are probably sick of me talking about Alphabet on this program, but <laughs> it, it just seems to keep providing value to investors in terms of entry points. And, you know, it's just off of all time highs right now, but we're not viewing it as expensive. I think, in fact, they've kind of lost a step against Microsoft. Now, I would make the argument that they were far and away the AI leader years ago. Microsoft acquired OpenAI. Then it was up to a question, and now it's probably, honestly, at least for, for generative AI, leaning towards open AI. So we have a problem here. They need to address it. And what I think is interesting about this name right at this very moment is all of the pieces are there for them to, to win this AI arms race. They have some of the best inter, uh, internet infrastructure in the world. They have some of the best access to, to resources in the world in terms of research and hardware from NVIDIA, the list goes on. And they have amazing consumer data, right? All these things feed into to what they can do with AI, so they just need to do it. And you and I were talking about this, this rumor that came out today about a potential deal I'm hoping it's not real because I don't want them focused on anything else but AI right now. So I still think there's tremendous value here. All you have to do is compare this company to other stocks in the M7, especially the AI leaders. And you can see that there's a lot of value here. There was a report they might be interested in HubSpot. So right. you, know, you hear about these reports all the time. Uh, let's get to your next top pick. This is Micron, yeah. which uh, is definitely part of the chip economy, uh, but it has a specific flavor. Yeah, that's right. So Micron, US-based memory company, the, the memory market in, in ter in, within semiconductors is commodity-like in that sense. There are boom and bust cycles. We just came out of a, a very prolonged down cycle in memory. I think if I remember correctly, there was four Micron, 17 consecutive months of lower EPS revisions mm. in a row. So we're on the other side of that now, thankfully. And Micron's gonna sell into various markets, but part of what's caught them up recently has been their exposure to high bandwidth memory. And that is needed for AI applications. And in our research recently, uh, and this applies to the next name I'm gonna talk about too, we saw the bottlenecks that were occurring around NVIDIA in memory and also in the foundry. So. This is something that I think can continue to work for quarters to come. Micron's already said they're sold out. So their fiscal year is not exactly the same as the calendar year, but they're sold out of their high bandwidth memory capacity for most of fiscal 25 already. Hmm. So all right, it's a good story. OK, we'll watch. <laughs> yeah. Little known fact, they're based in Boise, um, a company that uh, is based much further away. and tied to this chip theme you're watching, yeah. Taiwan Semiconductor is your third uh, pick. 
Right. So coming back to the idea of, of bottlenecks around one, one of the bottlenecks around these new generation of, of AI chips is, is packaging. And without getting too technical, it's just how, how can we make chips more efficient by fitting things on them more efficiently? So Taiwan Semiconductor is the leading contract manufacturer for companies such as Apple and NVIDIA and AMD. So just to clarify, a company like NVIDIA and AMD, actually, they design, but they go to Taiwan Semiconductor to get things built. So what's interesting about Taiwan Semiconductor, it kind of reminds me of Broadcom in a way, is you have weakness in certain parts, and then you have strength in AI-related applications. So Broadcom had weakness in uh, smartphone-related stuff, which is what we've seen with Taiwan Semiconductor but they've also had this strength in their AI application. So I think you can win with Taiwan Semiconductor in a couple ways. First of all, it's not expensive, but as their AI business continues to grow, and I think it's gonna do that for the next five years, um, and then you have the potential for a cyclical rebound on the smartphone side, there's a few levers that can lead to, I think, EPS um, upgrades throughout the course of this year. Okay, let's get to Daniel Strauss's top picks on this day. Number one is the Dynamic Active Preferred Share ETF, ticker symbol DXP in Toronto. Yeah, so thanks. These are kind of research highlights, and we've done a lot of research on PREFs over the years. Probably didn't publish anything particularly recently, but uh, uh, we think that at National Bank, we have some strategists who are getting very excited about PREFs. We know a lot of retail clients who've uh, very been very interested in PREFs over time. They're a risky asset class because they don't have a lot of growth potential, and they could draw down quite a bit depending on the rate environment. We believe that the rate environment may be constructive for the fixed resets that are in this ETF. It's actively managed. Uh, you know, they are going to be re, uh, resetting their payouts pretty soon, and we don't think that all of that is priced in, uh, even, even though it's had a current run-up. So uh, an actively managed PREF ETF worthwhile considering in addition to stocks and bonds and small amounts if you need yield. Okay. Number two on this day, the Horizons Enhanced All Equity Asset Allocation ETF. And I've looked at your notes here, and the first word in your note is caution. Caution advised. We have to put that disclaimer down when we're highlighting anything that has leverage in it. I should point out this doesn't have the same kind of very high octane leverage that's in the Beta Pro ETFs, which have 100% or 200% leverage. This is just a, uh, a relatively calm 25%. So with this kind of ETF, what you are actually doing is you're uh, putting in, let's say, $100, and then what's in, you get up $125 of buying power and exposure to basically global equities. It's like a multi-asset portfolio consisting only of equities. You have to pay the borrowing costs. That's coming out of NAV, and those can be significant when rates are high. But what we see is this ETF doing exactly what it's designed to do. It's kind of leveraged exposure to all equities. It gives you higher highs, lower lows. Um, if you are, very, again, a very long-term young investor and you are considering the other kind of all equity ETFs, this is just one notch higher on the risk spectrum than a 100-0, right? We talk about 60-40 portfolios, we've talked 80-20, where that other number is your bond weight. 100-0 mm -hmm. is a very popular category in Canada. This is kind of 125, negative 25. It's a bit exotic, fun to talk about. Uh, again, only for, uh, you know, iron-stomached investors. Okay. Uh, and on the final, uh, the final uh, top pick of today, the CI Money Market ETF, mm -hmm. ticker symbol CMNY yeah. in Toronto. Yeah, talk about doing a 180 from what we were just talking about, you know, leveraged exposure to all equities. This is money market. This is kind of like a cash alternative. We're talking about this ETF because it's, um, uh, we, we, we got a lot of questions about CSAV, the CI High Interest Savings Account in, uh, ETF. Th there's PSA as well. A bunch of these cash ETFs hold savings deposits, and the yields have come down a little bit because of regulatory changes for the banks on the back end, how they account for those deposits. So uh, we found that money market as an asset class, though traditional boring is now competitive uh, a little bit with traditional cash accounts look at this ETF consider its yield it's kind of active it holds very very short-term securities it's ultra safe it's extremely even the price chart looks kind of like a sawtooth because that's what it's doing it's just collecting the income from very boring very safe short-term instruments and paying it out to you uh, its yield is in their neighborhood between four and five uh, it's suitable as a kind of cash alternative in a portfolio right so is uh, do investors just park cash there for a relatively short period of time let's bring 
bring back the graph because saw, right. sawtooth is the way yeah. uh, to describe it. it. It's not intended to make any long-term uh, capital that, gains, correct? That's exactly right, yeah. You're, you're, what you're doing here, it's just purely like an income instrument. It pays a monthly distribution. So a cash account uh, that you have at a, at a bank will be accruing daily uh, to, into your balance. So you should consider the cash yields that you're getting in your account with an ETF like this. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. It depends on what you have access to. Uh, but if you are making a multi-ETF portfolio and you have two to 5% allocated to cash like we do in our models at any given time, as an actually as a tactical asset class, ETFs in the money market category are competitive with cash uh, and should be considered alongside it. Okay.